Let's, uh, let's pray. Lord, we have just so many reasons to be grateful and thankful to you for you have blessed us so wondrously. We thank you for Jesus. And we thank you because of him that we have a relationship with you, the one true living God. We thank you that that relationship is real and it is eternal and it is good. And we thank you that it provides for us life and hope, Lord. We thank you that it is a relationship that entails what genuine relationships are about, and that is communication, that we can talk to you and praise you and tell you of the things that are on our hearts and the concerns that we have, and that you hear and answer our prayers. We're thankful, Lord, that this relationship is also about you speaking to us, and we praise you that you are a God who does speak. You reveal yourself, you make yourself known, and we thank you that you have done that, Lord, in a way that we can turn to and read and study and know that it is true. And that is your word, the Bible. Thank you for the privilege of having it and having it in a language that we understand. And, and thank you, Lord, that you provide us with teachers and with preachers who can expound upon and preach your word. But more than all of that, Lord, we thank you that you are present and at work with us by your spirit to open our minds, to soften our hearts, to help us to have an eagerness and longing for the word of God, to, to help us, Lord, to know that when it is spoken to us, it is true and it is something that we are to be about. We praise you for that work of your spirit. And as we are reminded of what the Spirit of God does today, we ask for him to do it in us. We pray that you would open our minds and open our hearts, that we would receive your word today. I pray that you would bless as I stand before your people these, these last few times and, and all the emotions and all the things that are going on in me. I pray that you would help me to, to, to be steady and help me to faithfully preach your word. Lord, bless, we pray, as we look at your word in Christ's name. Amen. I know there are some, some guests who are here today. And if you are a first-time guest, you probably already know um, from the things that have gone on in the service already that we are in the midst of a transition um, and that transition is about me uh, accepting a call to go to another church. And what that means is that I'm only going to be in this pulpit a few more times, at least as your, as your pastor preaching your word and so preaching God's word. And so there's just all kinds of emotions and so forth that I'm experiencing today. And, and I, was, I was hoping that I would be able to come and preach today without tears, but I, I didn't succeed in the first service. It was bad, bad, bad. Uh, let's see if we can do a little bit better this service. I can get through it. You know, I started crying before I even read the text last time. It looks like I've done that again today. But I do want us to spend a few moments in, in God's word. And, and as we do so, I want to um, just speak from my heart a little bit to you. So beginning in verse 11, and by the way, we have, we have three sermons left. And today, we have four Sundays before I leave, three sermons that I'll be preaching, because I'll be out of town on the 14th. I'll be doing a wedding for one of our members um, in Chattanooga. So we'll have a guest speaker that Sunday. So I'll preach in today, next Sunday, then I'll be out for a Sunday, and then I'll come back and do my, my final Sunday with you guys. So the passage I've chosen for this sermon is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Beginning in verse 11, where we read these words. Finally, brothers, rejoice, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace will be with you all. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And this is God's word. 
So I don't have to tell you how hard this is because you, you already know and you've already experienced a little bit of my emotions this morning. But I, I, I'll tell you that it's not just hard to, to stand in front of you to be able to you know, preach these last sermons. That's, that's hard, incredibly hard, especially as I see you and, and I'm talking to you. That makes it even more difficult than, than you can imagine. But it's also, it's it really hard for me to, to think of what to say to you and, and, and what passage to go to and how to, to, to say these last things to you in these last few sermons. And, and I think part of the reason for that is because there's this part of me that I just want to say all the right things. And in saying all the right things, I want to make this easier for all of us, you and me as well. But I know that that's, that's something that's, that's kind of impossible when you're, when you're saying your, your goodbyes. In fact, I came across something, that a friend of mine, you guys know him, Brian Chappell, who was um, the former president of the seminary I went to, a dear friend of mine, and he's preached here at this church, and he's, he's a prolific writer. And one of the books that he wrote is a book called The Wonder of It All. And he says something in that book that I think kind of captures a little bit of what I'm feeling right now and what kind of makes these sermons hard for me. Well, he said this, that we long for quick fixes and we take pride in instant solutions and our faith in the amazing power of God's word, which is what we believe. I and mean, we believe in the amazing power of God's word here at Redeemer Church. I know I do. But he says that, that our faith in the amazing power of God's word gets wrapped into a magic mindset, convincing us that if we can remember just the right verse and say it just the right way, we will conjure a solution to every ill. And I can tell you, that's kind of where, where I was with this. If I could just think of the right passage and say it the right way, that you know, everybody's going to feel just great. We're going to leave here all happy about Mike's leaving, including me. And I'm going to be all happy about, about all of this. And, and so I struggled through this week. In fact, I was going in one direction. The reason why the worship service has the uh, preparation and reflection quote about prayer and then the Old Testament scripture reading, those don't have anything to do with what I'm going to preach today. <laughs> the, the reason for that is because I thought I was going to go in that direction. And I was really struggling with that. And then God laid something else on my heart and, and so forth. But saying all that, as I thought about what to say, I, I thought, you know, I cannot go wrong in saying my farewells. I cannot go wrong in saying goodbye. But, but, but if I just use what the Bible says when it says goodbye. And that's what led me to the passage that we are looking at today. This, this Paul's farewell to the Corinthian church. And I think from this passage, as we begin to dig into it a little bit and look at what Paul is saying here, I think I can say to you and, and I can apply some things to you in a way that there'll be things that you that will minister to your souls today. But I also think things that that you want to have over the weeks and the months ahead. And there are three things that I want to draw out of this passage. And really, these things are, are what Paul what Paul is doing here as he's, he's signing off, as he's saying his goodbyes to the Corinthian church. And, and they are these. Paul, first of all, he, he tells these believers some things that he, he wants them to do. And that's, that's, I want us to look at those things, things Paul calls them to do that I think are things that you as a congregation will want to do over the weeks ahead and months ahead. Uh, the second thing he does is he shares with them something that he wants them to know, a, a truth, a fact that he wants them to know. And then thirdly, he tells them something that he wants them to believe, something that they have to rest in. And that gets to the, this wondrous benediction that you see at the end of this particular passage. And so the first thing that he does is he tells them some things that he wants them to do. And actually, there's six things that he says here. And before I read those and then go back and I'll talk about those six things that Paul wants the Corinthians to do that I, I would say there would be wise and good for you to do as well as a church. I want you to notice how Paul begins. He begins this, this goodbye by saying, finally brothers. Now that's not limiting it to just men. In fact, it's a generic word that can be brothers and sisters. But I do want you to notice what he's saying. He's saying, finally brothers and sisters. Now the, the reason that should stand out to you is because it, 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 Paul, Paul didn't have to say it. Let me put it like that. In fact, Paul could have said this last section of this and you would have not known the difference. It would not have mattered at all to you in one sense if Paul had just said, finally, and then he skipped that and just said rejoice. And then he went on with the rest of the passage. And it would have made all the sense in the world. In fact, all the things that I'm going to say to you pretty much today would have still been true whether Paul added this brothers and sisters to it or not. But the reason why Paul adds that is because he, he wants to put in front of them as he says goodbye 
even though, you know, if you think about, we've, we've studied 1 Corinthians here as a church. These letters are not easy letters. Paul says a lot of really difficult things. There's some painful things that he says. 2 Corinthians is a letter that really is full of sorrow. But in all of that, as hard and difficult as this has been in this correspondence to the Corinthian church, Paul wants them to know how much they mean to him. And so throughout the letters, he calls them brothers and sisters. He reminds them of who they are. They, they are his brothers and sisters. And part of what makes this, I think, so difficult for all of us, and I know it makes it incredibly difficult for me, is that's true about the relationship that I have with you. We have walked together for 10 years. We've been together from the very beginning. You are my brothers and my sisters in Christ. You are my friends. And I've had the privilege of pastoring you, of marrying you, of, of baptizing your children, of bearing your loved ones, of being there for you in the midst of strife and trouble and issues and joys and the things of your life. I have walked with you and that means I'm going to miss you and you're going to miss me. And as much as it is, is true for me to say the real and right that God is calling me and placing me somewhere else, that doesn't, doesn't make the feelings any less. It doesn't make the emotions any less. It doesn't make the heartbreak any less that you are my brothers and sisters in Christ. And so Paul begins to say his goodbyes by saying, finally, finally, brothers and sisters. And then what he does is he goes on and he tells them, all right, here's, here are six things that, that you need to do. Six things you need to do. And notice, I'll read it to you. It's in verse 11 and 12, where he says, rejoice. First thing. Second thing is aim for restoration. Third thing, comfort one another. Fourth, agree with one another. Fifth, live in peace. And then you skip down. We'll come back to that little section there in a minute. But, but down in verse 12, greet one another with a holy kiss. These are imperatives in the Greek, which basically means they're all commands. And so when you read all of these, when I say that Paul is telling the church and telling us, this, the, the application to you, to do some things, this is what Paul's getting at. He, by using imperatives, he's commanding them. These are some things that you need to do. And the first one of these is, and, and I want you to hear me say this to you, in the midst of all that's going on, rejoice. That's the first thing. Rejoice. Now, I, I want you to, to, to understand, as you think about 2 Corinthians, how strange that would be in the context of 2 Corinthians. Because 2 Corinthians is a, a letter about sorrow and pain and persecution and hardship. All those kind of things are all through 2 Corinthians. It's, it's, it's so significant, that sorrow message that runs through 2 Corinthians, that some translators and commentators have looked at what Paul has done here when he says, finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. And they've actually changed it to this. In fact, if you had a new revised standard version of the Bible in front of you, you would read these words. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell or goodbye. And the reason for that is twofold. On the one hand, the reason is because this is Paul's goodbye. So it makes sense that he would say farewell or goodbye. But there's another reason why people at times struggle with translating this rejoice, which is actually the Greek word that's being used here. And the reason for that has to do with the fact that we struggle so much with thinking about something being joyful when it hurts so much. That there can be a place, and this is the way we, we I mean, we know this, when you go through, through circumstances that are difficult and painful and they trouble your heart and things aren't going the way that you would want them to go, that, that the last thing that we would want to think about in the midst of those times is joy, that this is a right place to be joyful. And yet, that is Paul. Because that is the gospel. Because what the gospel does is it links us in and connects us in and ties us into to a relationship with God where we can know and believe that regardless of what the circumstances may be, regardless if, if the circumstances are against the things that would naturally cause us to be happy or naturally cause us to be joyful, that there's something deep and profound going on because God has it. And so earlier in 2 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 10, Paul could actually say, being sorrowful, yet always joyful. That's why Paul could write a letter like the Philippian letter, and he would write it from prison to a persecuted people, and that would be the joy letter. Because he would know that God is at work in all of this, that God is doing something in the midst of, of all of this. That this is a time of sorrow. 
And it's real. And I feel it. And I'm not just feeling it in front of you. I feel it. I feel it. I mean, you know, I've, because, because I'm, I'm moving and I've you know, had a lot of stuff I've had to do over the last six weeks. I've been so busy and so wrapped up with so many different things that both here and other things and just getting ready and getting my house finally on the market. It took a ton of work that I've just not had time. And, and so I haven't grieved a lot over this, but this week, finally my house is on the market. And this week I was in the office and I was meeting with some folks and it just, it just struck me. The, you know, what, what you mean to me, what I mean to you. And, and it, it, it was real and it, it, it broke me. I and mean, it, it was, I think it was Tuesday of this week. I spent most of the day in just uncontrollable crying. I mean, just would stop for a minute and then it would hit me again and stop for a minute and it would hit me again and stop for a minute and hit me again. That's, that's reality. I mean, that's what happens when people you love go somewhere else. That's what happens when you leave someone you love. That's Right? That's reality. And yet at the same time, in the midst of sorrow, what Paul says we should be doing and what you should be doing and I should be doing is rejoicing. And I can give you some reasons for being joyful today in the midst of sorrow. You have every reason to be joyful for what God has done ten, over these 10 years. To rejoice over that. You have every reason to be joyful of what God will do. We don't know what that is. And, and it doesn't mean that everything's going to be just smooth and easy, but you know that God has you. That God has this. And there's reason to be joyful for the next chapter in Redeemer. I think there's reason to be joyful over God using me here and now God using me in another church to bless this church. That's a reason to rejoice. Because you are tied in and bound to those folks in Christ. That there's reason to rejoice over that. We are called to rejoice at this time. Notice he goes on and he says, aim for restoration. That's the second thing. This is the thing we need to do. Aim for restoration. You know, I thought well, a good heading for this at first would be to grow in maturity. But, but it's about something else. This word restoration that's used here. The word means to mend or it means to strengthen or it means to... In fact, one translator translation puts it this way, to put things in order. In other words, when, you know, all the things that Paul has said through the Corinthian correspondence to them, these are all things that he's, he's calling them. These are things you guys need to do. So he wraps up the letter by telling them, there's things that I've called you to do, do those things. That's really the point. Put those things in order. Keep doing the things you need to do. And don't forget that. And so if I were to give you a heading on this, it would be something like this. Keep on doing what you're supposed to do. And it is easy at this particular time to, to, to not do that. And I'll tell you how. Because losing a beloved pastor and then going through the transition for a next pastor, that's, that's not light, insignificant stuff. And what can end up happening is that can become all-consuming stuff. It is important. I'm not denying that. It is absolutely important that you have a pulpit search committee and that they're doing the diligent work of looking for the next man that God has to be in this pulpit. All that's important. You need to be in prayer for these folks. You need to be walking and supporting these folks. All of those things are true. But I'm telling you, this is critically important that you get. That's not everything. It's not everything. Things don't stop because you're doing that. The things that the church of the living God is called to do, those things that the scripture constantly reminds us to do, those are things we are to continue to do. You are to continue to do. So, so, so shepherding is to continue to happen and discipleship is to continue to happen and the work of, of discipline is to continue to happen and being in people's homes and with people who are hurting and, and so forth, those things are to continue to happen. Keep doing those things. Don't stop. Aim for restoration. The third thing he says here is comfort one another, which is to be there, to encourage one another and so forth. I, I was so proud of the session and you guys have been recipients of this. The elders at Redeemer Church, when I announced, sent out the letter to tell you guys that, that I would be accepting another call. And, and they, they, they went the extra mile because they sent out a letter with mine, which was, was appropriate. But I know a lot of churches that that would have been you send out another letter and then it's all okay. They didn't do that. Remember what they did? They got down in your lives. They were at your small groups, at your ministry meetings, at your growth groups. Why? Because they wanted to be there with you, close to you, walking with you, 
through this time. That there is this, this place in which we, when we go through hardship, difficulty, loss, we need to be close to each other. And I'm thankful that you have a session like that. Is walking with you through the midst of all of this, concern about where you are, wants to comfort you and encourage you in this. There's another way that word comfort it can be used or it's translated, and that is to exhort. And so there's a sense in which there's an encouragement. There's also an exhortation. And so that to exhort one another, and I will tell you a way that I think that you need to be exhorted. And a loving exhortation. But it is this. It, it is a challenge of your commitment. That your commitment is, is not primarily to me. It is a commitment to the Lord and a commitment to this church. And I would encourage you and exhort you and challenge you as you think about that. You know, in the first service today, Kelly McNoggin, he prayed, he prayed for me. And he, he, he prayed that, that the next guy that God would lead to come into this place would know that he's not a guy to come in and, and fill my shoes. And then he said this, it was funny in the prayer. He said, because Mike is taking his own shoes. <laughs> and that's true, right? That you would think about giving your heart to this next man, that the Lord would be here to shepherd and pastor you. That the Lord would send to be your pastor. That exhortation to a commitment to the Lord's church. The next two of these I want to hold together because I think they're linked, but they deal with two different things. Where he says, agree with one another and live in peace. In some ways, the, the, the flip side of the same coin. Agree with one another and live in peace. One deals with vision. One deals with heart. John Calvin, the Protestant reformer, put it this way, to agree with one another and, and to live in peace are expressions which mean two different things, but the one takes its rise from the other. The former relates to agreement of sentiment. The latter denotes benevolence, the union of hearts. And so what this is getting at is how, how as, a, as a congregation, and we've seen this over these years, how, how, how God has bound us together for purpose and vision. Brian prayed that today. The, 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 what God is doing through the gospel in this church to bring people together, all of that is a part of God's glorious vision for this church. But what we have seen is not a, not a vision out there that we're pulling people towards it. We've seen how we are committed in heart and love for each other towards that vision. This is something that is absolutely critical for the future of Redeemer. That not only is this about a vision out there, some kind of abstract thing, some kind of nebulous thing, but it's something that you, you are tied into, your hearts are committed to, that you're bound together with one another in this. It's about relationship. It's not just about purpose. It's about loving each other. It's not just about a thing that you're trying to achieve. It's about how the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ has knit and bound you together. Now, here's something that's interesting. If you go on right after that, what, right after he says, Paul says, agree with one another, live in peace. Notice a statement is given right after that. And the statement is, and the God of love and peace will be with you. Now, I want you to understand that statement. It is not saying that if you comfort one another, if you agree with one another, if you live in peace, you're going to merit God's love and peace with you. In fact, you cannot have the comfort of one another, agreement with one another, and live in peace without God first working. And so let me back you up before I make my ultimate point here and back you up and tell you something. I mean, back in the early days when Redeemer was starting, I, I remember because of, of just trying to do this kind of work in, in Jackson and in this denomination, there were very few people who looked at us and thought, man, this thing is going to be what it is today. Actually, I don't know if anybody thought that. But then after a little while, and this thing started to take hold, and people did what, they normally, what people normally do, and they was this, what's the secret? In other words, it started to happen, and now what's the secret? What made this happen at Redeemer? And I remember over and over and over, Steve and I would say, well, the secret is you have to have what, no, we didn't do that. You know what we would say? God showed up. God was here. He worked. It wasn't any magic here. It wasn't any magic from me. It wasn't any particular thing like that. It was, it was God just working to accomplish what God wanted to happen. Okay? That God did this. And so then if you go back and you look at the text and you, you ask, oh, okay, how is it that we agree with one another? How is it that we live in peace, harmony? How do we have that? Even though we come from differing backgrounds and we're different people and we think in different ways, how are we bound together? It's because God does this in the gospel. 
But let me put a warning out to you. Because we don't merit this by our behavior. But I'm telling you, if this church in its future is not about comforting one another and agreeing with one another and living in peace, then what you should expect, if that's not happening, is Satan is going to find a foothold in here. And he's going to cause havoc in this church. See, here's the thing that's so important you recognize, that what Paul is saying to the Corinthians, look, comfort one another, agree with one another, live in peace, be together in Christ, then what you can be assured of is this. It's not married in it, but you can be assured of this fact, that the God of love and peace is going to be with you. Just love on each other. Continue to make it about what Jesus has always made it about. And here's an assurance. God will continue to be with you. Now, God doesn't ever leave us. He doesn't. I'm not saying that. But I do know this. Through our foolishness at times, we give the evil one inroads into our midst and he tears things up. Don't let that happen. And then it leads us to the last thing. That is greet one another with a holy kiss. Now, you know that's cultural, so I'm not going to sit here and tell you if you just start kissing each other, you're really going to feel good about everything. I'm not going to tell you that. So. But it, you know, that greeting, that, that kiss, that holy kiss, was a, it's a, it was a cultural expression in the ancient world, but it meant something. It, it meant acceptance of those who were in Jesus. That's the only thing, the holy kiss. It's set apart. Those set apart, it meant full acceptance. To not give the, whole, the, the holy kiss in the ancient world meant disrespect and pushing away. Okay? Being, I'll give you an example of that. Back in Luke chapter 7, you may remember this passage where, where Jesus enters the home of Simon the Pharisee. And you'll probably remember the passage because that's the passage where this woman just broke down crying and she wet his feet and she used her hair to wipe his feet and then she used this ointment to, to put on his feet. And Simon the Pharisee, he criticized Jesus and criticized her over doing all of that. And do you remember what Jesus said to him? One of the things he said to him, he pushed back and he rebuked him. And he said, I came into your house and you did not greet me with a kiss. You know what that was? It was a sign of disrespect. You're not really welcome here. I want the show, but I don't want you. See? Something that has made Redeemer so special, so precious, and, and so beautiful is that it doesn't matter who you are. It really doesn't. It doesn't matter that you're, you're, you're white or black or rich or poor. It doesn't matter what school you went to. It doesn't matter what community you live in. Those, those things don't matter. It doesn't matter how you vote. It doesn't matter any of those things that you bring. And all that, that, that diversity, all those things that we bring, what matters is that you are in Jesus. That matters. And so we learn what it means to make room, to, re to receive. And we may not be kissing all over you with our mouths, but I pray to God that regardless of who you are, when you've walked into the, the doors of this church, you have felt that kiss. That there's a home for you here because of Christ. That you matter here. And so Paul tells them these things to do. These are things that, that I'm saying that you must do. You must rejoice. You must continue to do the things God's called you to do. You must comfort one another and pursue unity and live in peace and ultimately respect each other and welcome each other. That leads to the next thing. Paul shares with them something he wants them to know. And this is, it's kind of interesting, but it's important. It's verse 13. All the saints greet you. All right, why would he sign off saying that? All the saints greet you. Okay. It, 
Here's the reason. He, he wants them to know, and I want you to know, that you are bound into something bigger than just you. That you matter to others. That others have a vested interest. You know, most likely Paul's talking about the churches of Macedonia who had a vested interest and concern for the Corinthian church. Do you realize that there are churches all over this denomination and all over this city that have a vested interest in you? Now, the elders know this and the pulpit search committee knows this, but I know that in this congregation, there are a lot of people who are here today and you don't come out of our tradition. So you don't understand the connectionalism, the, the support, the, the safety net that is yours because you are a part of this particular denomination. And so there are people and you've some of you have told me this. There's this fear at times of like, well, if Mike leaves, then what's going to happen? I can assure you that you, you won't have Mike here, but you won't have a fool in this pulpit. It ain't going to happen. Why? Because there are all kinds of people, session, presbytery, uh, all kinds of people who are all about putting in some love on Redeemer right now. Okay. now let me push that further. How do I say this? And tap, tap it into the greening. You will not have me as your pastor as of June 21st, but you will have me. I won't be right here, but I would love to be able to bless you in any way that you would want from where I am. Okay? I will pray for you. I will be available. I've already told the pulpit search committee and the elders this. If you need anything, I'm hoping and hey, give it some time, but. I'm hoping to get an invitation to come back and preach. Don't ask me to preach the next week after I leave, okay? <laughs> Give me some time. Invite me back into the pulpit. And, uh, and let me say one other thing. There's a church in Miami, Florida. The name of the church I'm going to is called Old Cutler Presbyterian Church. That is all for you and praying for you. I know there's this thing, and I'm, I'm certain it's in some of you. There's this thing that's, that's like... I can't stand that church in Miami because <laughs> they done stole our pastor away, right? Okay. Just like, I want you to hear me say this so you get the point. When I came here 10 years ago, there was a church in Miami that I was pastor. They were like, I can't stand that church in Jackson because they stole our pastor away. And, and most likely, because you will want someone that has some pastoral experience in this pulpit leading this congregation, that there's going to be someone that's in another pulpit somewhere that will become the pastor of this church as possible. And those folks may say, there are people in Jackson that stole our pastor away, right? It's not that. It isn't. You know, we believe that, that God is the one who kind of leads this church and assigns as he will. That God is at work in this. And I tell you, and this is, I'm not exaggerating, I'm not lying to you to make you feel good. From the time Old Cutler started talking to me, through the, that decision, and once I've decided, that church has continually prayed for Redeemer. And I pray that you would do the same for them. Okay? This greeting, this is something you need to know. We're tied into something bigger. And then that leads to the last thing. That's something we need to believe. And that's the benediction. And I love this benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I love this benediction so much. In my first church, I used this benediction every Sunday for five, for five years until somebody came up to me and said, dude, you do know there are other benedictions in the Bible. I was like, yeah, I like this one. So I, I switch up. So I didn't do that to you guys, but I love this benediction. I'll tell you why. Because it, in, in the New Testament, this is the one blessing of the benediction that it, it, it gives the, the Trinity, the God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And, and what I want you to recognize that Paul's doing here as he signs off this letter, and this is what I hope you hear today, is that the reason the Trinity is in it is because Paul's making this point. All that God is, is for you. That's what he's saying. All that God is, is for his church. And so if you look at the specific things, he talks about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the Son of God. He talks about the love of God, that's the Father. And he talks about the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. 
Now, one writer in looking at that made this statement that the grace of Christ banishes self-assertiveness and self-seeking. The love of God pushes jealousy and, and anger to flight. While the fellowship created by the Spirit leaves no room for quarreling and factions. Now, when you hear that, what this is saying is this. All these things, it talks about the Trinity, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. It's talking about aspects of the personhood of the Godhead that are the provision for these things. For rejoicing, for aiming for restoration, for comforting one another, for agreeing with one another, for living in peace, for greeting one another with a holy kiss. In other words, what he's saying is, here's how you do this. You trust in God who is always there for you. Something that I have taught and preached, and I hope you would be able to say, I've led this way. As I've said to you over and over and over again, that Jesus Christ alone is the king and the head of this church. That means he is the good and great shepherd. That means I am the under shepherd. Under shepherds leave. The good shepherd never does. And that's why the psalmist David would say, what? The Lord is my shepherd, not Mike or not any other man. The Lord is my shepherd. Because of that, I shall not want. Because he has you. Trust in him. Lean on him. And he will bless. Let's pray together. Father, we are thankful for this time in your word, for this reminder of these truths, and for the way that even the Bible uh, forces us to come to terms with goodbyes. Lord, thank you for allowing me to reflect and spend some time and talk about these things from this passage. And I pray that, um, Lord, it's helped to minister to your people. Continue to gird us up. Keep Redeemer in your care. Watch, watch over this beautiful congregation and bless her. In Jesus' name, amen.